whilst it was nasty, it was high profile, it was a relatively straightforward investigation and the priority being find, finding Raul Mo and a lot of police forces um, deal with that sort of thing week in, week out. But Raul Moat seemed to have vanished off the face of the earth. Police made 28 arrests in an effort to track him down, without success. After dark, Moat contacted them. He made a mobile phone call, which changed everything. Hello there, this is the gunman from Burnley last night. Uh, my name is Raul Moat. Um, what I'm phoning about is to tell you exactly why I've done what I've done, right? Now, my girlfriend has been having an affair behind my back with one of your officers, this gentleman that I shot last night, the Claudia instructor. So the fact of the matter is, right, that she's having an affair with one of your officers. Was he the yep. police officer? I wouldn't have shot him. Okay. Right? You'll get your chance to kill us, right? You'll get your chance to kill us. Tragically, this was no idle threat. Minutes after placing the call, Moat spotted a police traffic officer parked up at a key intersection on the edge of Newcastle. PC David Rathband, a married father of two, was nearing the end of his late shift. The officer had chosen his spot carefully. Experience had taught him criminals often use this route to quickly escape the city. But crucially, the police didn't know that Moat was travelling in a mate's black Lexus car. So Raoul Moat had his first police officer in his sights. The black Lexus was caught on the police car's camera, circling the roundabout. I just stared at him. And then uh, the next thing I remember seeing is um, him just standing by the window, just completely emotion. There was no emotion. He was just as if he'd frozen. And uh, I just remember the big flash from the gun. And um, it just lit up the whole of my face. It, it was the noise then. Um, it was just, you know, I said before, it was like um, my head inside a can with the largest firework. But it's, um, it was worse than that. It was just unbearable, the noise. I knew I was in trouble because of the amount of, the amount of blood I was losing. I just knew that I was going to bleed to death. After being shot for a second time, in a bid to survive, PC Rathband played dead. Moat bought the sham and ran back to the Black Lexus, believing he'd killed his first officer. Fifty minutes later, Moat was taunting the police again. Hello, this is Sir uh, Roland, the Birdie Gunman. Are you taking this serious now? I've just found your office out at the, uh, the roundabout at the west end of Newcastle. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm going to destroy a few lives like you've destroyed mine. This is what happens when you push, 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 and push. I'm telling you now, I'm absolutely not going to stop. You're, You're not going to have to kill. You're going to have to kill me. Right. And I'm never going to stop. In Raoul Moat's own words, this was a declaration of war. He was declaring war on Northumbria police. He was convinced they'd been out to get him for all these years, and now he was out to get them. The police ran a series of public appeals asking Moat to give himself up. Mr Moat, I have made a number of requests to you to contact police and hand yourself in. That opportunity still exists. Behind the scenes, Northumbria Police's Assistant Chief Constable was in day-to-day -day command of the operation to find and stop Raoul Moat. He's clearly angry, um, he's agitated, um, but he's not somebody who's lost control of his mind. Um, this was a clear, stated intention, and that intention was to kill uh, Northumbria police officers. 
PC David Rathband survived, but paid a huge price. He's been left permanently blind. For the force, the attack on one of their officers was incendiary. I took it as a personal attack. I'd never met PC Rathband, but he was one of my colleagues, and I've been in that position before. I've been sitting in my police vehicle on static patrol, watching um, what's going on round about me. And you think, yeah, that could have that could have been me. During the middle of the following night, Moat visited a friend's house to deliver a 40-page letter confessing to the shooting. This letter was the innermost thoughts of a man right on the edge. He was unburdening everything about his motivation for the shootings. It was deluded and um, um, it was paranoid, but in his eyes, it was a justification for his actions. He wrote, the crimes I have committed are to people who have wronged me in some way. It gave us a bit of an insight into what was making them tick. We were able to identify there was somebody here that uh, wasn't going to be found easily, um, but it was somebody who was contemplating taking his own life as well. The letter continues, all my life I wanted death, hence the reason I took risks and made the worst kind of enemies. It's always somebody else's fault with most. It's, it's, always, it's often the police's fault social services, it's girlfriend's fault, it's very rarely Raoul Moat's fault. Finally, Moat threatens, I will keep killing police until I'm dead. They've hunted me for years, now it's my turn. 24 hours later, police got a vital breakthrough that gave them a handle on just where Raoul Moat had gone to ground. The black Lexus used in the shooting of PC Rathband was spotted parked up near the picturesque Northumbrian village of Rothbury. We went to walk our dogs and we parked beside the Lexus and just noted that there was a black Lexus. Made a comment about the registration because it was unusual and I telephoned the police. At this point, the police had a real dilemma. They knew Moat had two men with him, Carl Ness and Karam Awan. Ness was Moat's business partner and Awan was a friend who worked as a car mechanic. Neither man had a history of violence, and the police didn't know whether they were accomplices or being held against their will. I've got two hostages at the minute, right? Can you confirm we've got two hostages? I'll confirm I've got two hostages, yes. The hostage situation was a huge complication. Huge complication. Until you prove otherwise, you need to deal with them as genuine hostages, because if you don't, you're at risk of contributing to them being killed. But the police had discovered letters from Ness and Awan written to their families. One in particular suggested they were anything but genuine captives. It used expressions like, I'm safer than safe. It didn't ring true for somebody who was genuinely being held against their will and genuinely uh, fearing for their safety. Shortly after police discovered the abandoned Lexus, Carl Ness and Kuram Awan were spotted walking down a main road near Rothbury. The helicopter got up there very quickly and, and identified these two walking along the road. From the descriptions and the information and intelligence we had, it looked like it was our um, hostages, and I use the term uh, carefully. We didn't know whether they were armed or not, so they had to be arrested in a safe and professional way. The only way to do that was with the armed officers. Police used firecrackers as a distraction, and within seconds, the two men were on the ground and cuffed. I think the most frustrating part was that at that very, very point that we arrested them, I think we were probably within about 100 yards of, 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 of Mort himself. Eventually, Carl Ness and Kuram Awan were handed down life sentences for assisting Moat in his violent campaign of vengeance. But in the days to come, the police were to find themselves increasingly frustrated and under the media spotlight. My hope, and I would have to say my expectation was, at that time, we would uh, very quickly find more. And uh, it, was, it was quite disappointing that we didn't, because there was always the concern that he may have slipped a net. 
Although they had been unable to collar Moat at the same time as his accomplices, the police did find where he'd been camped out. Amongst the abandoned debris was a further vital clue to the killer's deeply disturbed state of mind. Crucially, there was a, a, a dictaphone which Moat had spent uh, quite a significant amount of time recording his thoughts. He started to uh, express his dislike for the press and the media for perceived lies and he decided then to make some specific threats towards the general public and it was along the lines of for the next lie that's printed I will shoot an innocent member of the public. Moat had been able to monitor how the hunt for him was going and crucially what was being said about him. He'd grown increasingly agitated at the exposure of his troubled family relationships. <laughs> The violent and dysfunctional nature of Moat's relationships with women passed over into his relationship with children as well. There were a number of incidents which speak volumes about his manner in dealing with children. He disciplined one child by forcing her to stand in the street with a jester's hat on and a sign around her neck saying that she'd been naughty. There were reports that he had beaten to death one of the family pet dogs in front of a child. So however much he would tell people, however much he held this belief that he wanted a stable family life with women and with children and family, all of his behaviour undermined that. Moat's own mother, who hadn't had much contact with him since his teenage years, even joined the ranks of her son's detractors. But Angus Moat tried to counter negative coverage of his brother. I spoke to one reporter initially, um, just to get another side of it to roll, to say, look, this is out of character, you know, he's, he's had some kind of breakdown. But I did want to get that message over that he hadn't been abandoned by his family. But his message never got through. Acutely aware of how media interest was now at fever pitch and that some reporting might actually be making Moat's mental state worse, the police had to get journalists on side. We, we really had to sit the media down and ask for a blackout. Um, so that we could we could say, look, can we just have a ceasefire in relation to the personal stories that were being printed um, around Mort, around relationships he had had, about accomplices, all of which clearly, in the mind of Mort, was adding to his murderous intent and had actually um, added a new dimension to it, that not only was this about killing members of Northumbria police, this was about killing the public. <laughs> you think you're dealing with something which is at the higher end of threat, you've then got to move it up tenfold. The public were genuinely scared, make no mistake about it. People in Northumberland were very, very concerned. It was just not known where he was. The hunt for Raoul Moat was far from over. There would be three more tension-filled days before its violent and bloody end. We're now being moved back. The cordon's being moved away from our initial vantage point here for everybody's safety. It had been four days since Samantha Stobart was shot in the stomach and her boyfriend Christopher Brown was gunned down in cold blood by Raoul Moat. He'd blinded a policeman said he intended to murder many more and then threatened that innocent members of the public would be the next to die. You're dealing with somebody who, in my view, was um, about as dangerous as a man can get. Hundreds of armed officers from 18 police forces swamped the ground, while an RAF tornado jet armed with specialist heat-seeking equipment circled in the air. but still the police were unable to find the fugitive Raoul Moat. As soon as you approach Rothbury itself, it very much is rural. It's in the middle of the countryside. You've got woodlands on both sides and it's very dense. And all of this you're looking at as potential places where someone could hide. So in terms of concealing yourself in those areas, it's very, very easy and very hard to find someone on the other side of the coin. And as the days dragged on, fear began to poison the lives of ordinary people in Rothbury. 